our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we will visit the Arabian Peninsula. We will begin in poverty-stricken Yemen, where the men carry their dull daggers tucked in their waistbands. It is here that we shall discover the rock formation claimed to be the petrification of Noah's Ark. Then, we will drop by the Yemeni island of Socotra to revel in the beauty of untouched nature. We will continue our wandering in style by going to opulent Oman. Here, we will explore the intricacies of frankincense and discover the charm of camels. And to wrap it all up, we'll witness the breathtaking spectacle of nature on the shores of the Indian Ocean. Yemen stretches across an area of 500,000 square kilometers and is surrounded by some of the world's richest nations. In the time of the Roman Empire, Yemen used to be known as the Fortunate Arabia. It is universally considered an ancient and beautiful country. Its geographic position contributes to its fortune as well as its misery. Yemen lies in the crosshairs of a cultural and trading intersection. Unfortunately, it is also directly in the path of an important military zone. The Yemeni territory has been subject to the reign of countless empires and kingdoms. One of the best known rulers of Yemen was a Sabaean king who annexed this region from 750 BC to 115 AD. Not long after 115 AD, the prophet Muhammad began to spread the Islamic faith, which took root in Yemen. Let us take a trip to the distant past, to the city of Marib, once comparable to Rome in its importance to the area. The Wadi Hadramaut is an extensive valley in the midst of a parched expanse. It is one of the first areas in the world where civilization settled. Hans Helfritz first discovered it for the world in 1935. It was the traveler Helfritz that nicknamed it the Manhattan of the Desert. Judge for yourself. These mud and straw skyscrapers were erected here at the same time as wild game was still roaming, but today is Manhattan. The land of the Queen of Sheba lies wedged in between the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. There used to be an extensive dam here which facilitated the irrigation of an area of 10,000 hectares. Such a feat of irrigation was unheard of at the time. The dam split the surrounding land in two. It was for this reason that the area became known as the land of two paradises. Though it is almost impossible to imagine, on this very spot, the Garden of Eden existed around 1,000 years BC, literally right here. The topography has radically changed over the last 3,000 years. Well, something did survive the lapse of time. Look carefully at this rock formation. Doesn't it resemble a ship? The Yemeni people believe that this is the petrified Noah's Ark. It's almost as if the Ark fossilized, captain and all. The captain of the Ark was none other than Shem, Noah's son. The Yemeni believe that Shem became petrified because he refused to become a Muslim. In Yemen, one rule applies more so here than anywhere else in the world. Every man is supposed to carry a knife. We're not suggesting that there's anything wrong with that. But the fact is that most of these daggers are completely dull and meant only for ornamental purposes. The Yemeni jambias will differ in design, not only depending on the status of their owners, but also based on the area where that owner lives. According to Yemeni custom, when a boy is no longer allowed to be among the harem, he carries a jambia to symbolize that he has become an adult. The intricate patterns on the daggers often attract more attention than the dagger's blade. Here in Yemen, there are seemingly a countless number of places you can go to watch the craft of dagger making. Your dagger experience would not be complete without stopping to watch by a street vendor bargaining and squabble with a buyer. The scene bears a strong resemblance to a sporting match, complete with a clear winner. 
The seller always wins. However, the real purpose of our visit to Yemen is to witness the miracles of nature. Needless to say, here, there seem to be miracles everywhere. We must leave the poor Yemenis to their prayers and their everyday lives. The Imams are calling their worshipers to prayer. And so, it is time for us to head for Socotra. This Yemen island occupies one full square kilometer and overflows with an unusual amount of nature's marvels. We are on Socotra, a somewhat remote archipelago that is considered more poor than the mainland of Yemen. But for biologists, Socotra is a veritable paradise, comparable in importance to the Galapagos. The unique and fascinating characteristic of the local fauna and flora is closely linked to its geological history. Scientists consider Socotra to be the most remote piece of dry land in the history of planet Earth. The high degree of endemism is the result of isolation. The endemism is what makes the entire archipelago a significantly remarkable location, both for its biogeography as well as in terms of evolution. 30% of the 900 plants here are endemic, and 10 species are unique. In fact, the pomegranate and the aloe plant originated here. There is so much to admire here. As recently as 1977, a never-before-seen endemic freshwater crab was discovered here, habitating within the mountain streams. Despite the existence of this unusual crab, we can't overlook the abundance of common crabs on the shores. It would be virtually impossible to ignore them anyway, given their sheer numbers and the intricacies of their sand fortresses. What could easily be overlooked, if one is not careful, is a narrow strip of nature that evokes an otherworldly impression. This is an outright botanical gem. Mother Nature manifests her might here, in the midst of endless sand. Along a tiny stream flourishes nature comparable to that found in the Swiss Alps. Everywhere you look, something utterly unique can be seen. The locals refer to these plants by a somewhat unflattering phrase. As far as we can translate, they are called the backside of an elderly fat lady with her head buried in the ground. Nevertheless, not even a hideous name diminishes the awe with which scientists view the Socotra Desert Rose. In order to survive in such harsh conditions, the plants here evolved so as to preserve water in an exemplary manner. Something resembling a small flask containing liquids forms a part of their roots, out of which the plants are able to draw energy. Socotra is veiled in myths and legends. 
the mythical phoenix bird left his fiery nest once every 500 years to circle human abodes and bring to them life-giving fire on his glowing feathers. According to this legend, Socotra was the fiery nest of the phoenix. Socotra today is classified as a treasure chest of the world's natural heritage, particularly due to its prehistoric fauna and flora. A vast majority of the island's flora and fauna are endemic, meaning they do not exist anywhere else in the world. Among the best known is the dragon blood tree, Dracena cinnabari. It resembles a giant mushroom. Its treetop is made of long, thick green needles. The tree survives on dew that collects onto these needles at night. Each of the dragon blood trees are hundreds of years old. Oddly, they almost never reproduce. There are no small trees here. The dragon blood tree has a red sap, cinnabar, which the local people collect and use as an antiseptic or as a colorant. In the past, this sap represented a valuable export. Roman warriors smeared their bodies in the dragon blood tree sap so that if they became injured, they would have a clean wound that would heal faster. In those days, it was truly worth its weight in gold. Let us not disturb this mesmerizing piece of land. What nature created over thousands of years can very easily cease to exist within a single decade. Welcome to the Sultanate of Oman. A sultanate is an unusual state system in which the sultan rules. It seems like something out of the Thousand and One Nights fairy tale. Welcome to Oman, a country that is still considered secluded and on its own. Despite the vast oil-based wealth of Sultan al Qabus, who has aggressively sought to bring modernization to his country, Oman manages to preserve its traditions due, in part, to its lack of accessibility to the rest of the world. The greatest source of financial wealth of Oman may be oil, but the Omani landscape is blessed with a deep history and natural beauty that manifests splendor with literally every step. Magical wadis, what we would call valleys, are ever present. Wadis are created when the occasional water flows through dry regions, eroding the soil. Immediately after the rare periods of rain that occur, the water flows rapidly and creates the steep walls of the valleys. The most spectacular wadi in Oman is Wadi Shab. Its source is near the provincial town of Tiwi. The road into the pass meanders through some amazing natural beauty along irrigation canals. Owing to its oil wealth, the Sultan can afford to realize even some very extravagant ideas. For instance, here, in front of the Sultan's palace, they lay red asphalt instead of a red carpet. As you may have heard, you will never see Omanis working in Oman. All the laborers are from poorer Arab countries, usually from Yemen. And so it is that even the harvest of the fruit in the Garden of Oman is done by foreigners. Banana plantations stretching across hundreds of hectares of land are irrigated through an ingenious system of canals using drinking water. This, however, is exclusive of the natural underground wealth. Here, Mooksail spurts salty seawater from hollows. The pressure is so great that during high tide, a sort of sea geyser is created.
Long before the oil wealth began filling the Sultan's treasury, an entirely different commodity was the main source of income. On the shores of the Indian Ocean, near the Garden of Oman, lies the beginning of the Incense Road. Incense was extremely popular in medieval Europe. The Incense Road originated here on the Salala Plain. It was located on a bay which coincidentally had a port. The port was named Kor Rory and was discovered only recently. The real origin of the Incense Road, however, is right here in this crater, which appears to have originated in Oman. The slopes of the surrounding mountains are peppered with small, atypical trees with ugly leaves of interesting shapes. Among the trees are a maze of well-trodden paths made by the incense collectors. The incense trees have thick leaves to ensure survival in the desert. A question presents itself. Why doesn't such a tree find a place to live in a slightly more hospitable environment? A virtual army of biologists attempted to plant this tree almost everywhere else on the planet, but had no success. The Omani explanation goes as follows. The incense tree is a gift from Allah. The land upon which it grows may not be sold. The owner who attempts to do so would thus indicate his arrogance for Allah and his gift. The incense trade thrives here. The incense road leads from the Rub al Khali Desert, otherwise known as the Empty Space West, all the way to the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. From there, it continues to Europe. When the incense reaches Europe, it is referred to by its Latin name, frankincense. Clearly, incense marketing was important as far back as the Middle Ages. Let's take a short trip up this incense road. Now we are off to Muscat. The first thing to notice in Muscat is a giant incense burner. It is in the Al Riyam Park above the Mutra Quarter. Thankfully, it functions solely as a lookout point because, should it burn, it would embalm possibly the whole of Oman. We are at the souk. Naturally, a traditional incense burner is the first thing we see. We conclude our own incense road here in the local stores. Different varieties of incense are available, including sandalwood. The place is enveloped in a lovely scent, which emanates through the entire souk. Before we head off to the great Red Wahiba Desert, let's acquaint ourselves with the most loyal and necessary companion for anyone wishing to traverse the desert and survive its endless emptiness, the camel. The Bedouins claim that the camel is the Atta Allah, or God's gift. The camel is the best adapted of all animals to a life in the desert. It can go extended periods without any water, but once a camel decides to drink, it is a sight worth watching. A camel takes in some 150 liters, enough to fill a large bathtub. Also, it can digest just about anything, from cardboard to an old shoe. Arabian camels have only one hump. They are able to draw energy out of the oil and fat they have accumulated in this hump. For the Bedouins, a camel is not only a means of transportation, but an invaluable source of nutrition as well. Bedouins drink camel milk and eat camel meat. Camel wool is used in weaving rugs, sacks, and tents. Camel droppings are used as fuel, and the skin and stomach are used as vessels to carry water and milk. The camel is, in every sense, absolutely necessary for survival in the desert. Welcome to what is very likely the most beautiful desert in the world. The Great Red Wahiba Desert commences right here. It resembles a rough sea, covering a relatively small area, 12,500 square kilometers. It pales in comparison to the 9 million square kilometers of the African Sahara. Its modest dimensions are enhanced by unique ambience and breathtaking beauty. This region, measuring 180 kilometers from north to south and 80 kilometers east to west, was named after the Bedouin tribe, the Wahiba.
sand dunes, measuring as high as 100 meters, are continuously enlarging as a result of the prevailing monsoon winds. For all but a few, this is a remote and hostile place, only crossed by caravans of Bedouins. But appearances are often deceptive. Even in this apparent wasteland, we find life. Having originated during the Quaternary period by the continuous impact of the southwesterly monsoons and northern trade winds, this desert is the home to 16,000 species of animals and 160 types of plants. The desert turns into semi-desert, which stretches all the way to the most easterly hook of the Arabian Peninsula, the Ras Al Had Cape. stunning beach at the very tip of the Arabian world. For unknown reasons, this beach is a favorite among the sea turtles that come here from all over the Indian Ocean. These huge sea turtles beach themselves from the ocean just past midnight. They emerge onto the beach in respectable numbers in search of the perfect spot to lay their eggs. They dig themselves into the sand, lay their eggs, and quickly head back into the safe haven of the sea. Sometime later, troops of turtle hatchlings follow into the depths of the ocean. Watching these adorable babies is almost like watching human children as they pursue their very first steps. They must reach the waterline before dawn, as the heat from the rising sun would scorch and kill them. They are literally running for their lives. Sadly, many of them actually go in the wrong direction away from the water. As a result, they don't live very long lives. that make it into the Indian Ocean. We wish them bon voyage. May they live long, healthy lives. Good night. Sabah al -khair. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we're going to the Caribbean. We'll discover an ingenious and very considerate way to visit the rainforest in Antigua. On Barbuda, we will watch a colony of magnificent frigate birds. From the Caribbean, we'll go to New South Wales, one of the Australian territories. The breathtaking Blue Mountains are a favorite destination in New South Wales for tourists and mountain climbers alike. Then, we'll return to the Caribbean. We'll venture to the British Virgin Islands. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature.